One of the most interesting discoveries I've made in recent years is the huge body of work produced by the French poet Pierre Hevedy. Um, Dr. Fred Grubb introduced me to French poetry and pointed me in this direction generally. And Fred Grubb um, was one of the members of the group and he was the only member who was more a critic than a poet. Um, he is credited quite justifiably with having made known to the general public through a critical text he wrote the huge power of Ted Hughes uh, nature poetry uh, but Grubb's interests are far wider than Ted Hughes and um, Reverdy is celebrated in France as one of France's greatest 20th century poets quite realistically so. Um, Gallimard have recently produced his entire collected poems and I think the volume is somewhere between 1200 and 2000 pages. Uh, the problem with the actual printed text of French poetry is that books are not indexed by title and they're not indexed by first lines they are simply presented chronologically with titles relating to subtitles of individual long out of print collections and Reverdy is a very difficult poet to approach chronologically because he was part of the Cubist movement I think he wrote one of the early texts on Cubism and he was surrounded by Braque, Picasso, Matisse and Juan Gris and his early poems were illustrated by these great artists. But my own feeling is that this was not his best period of work. But unfortunately the, the text that's most readily available, in fact one of the very few texts of Reverdy, is, is a very small collection of translation by Mary Ann Cors, who was a, many years ago was a professor of French literature and by the American poet John Ashbery. And although these translations are technically good, I myself question the wisdom of the choice of poems. The early poems of Reverdy are an attempt to create a cubist poetry which juxtaposes images of surfaces, perhaps in some way reminiscent of the work of de Chirico in painting. But what works in graphic arts does not seem to me to work terribly well in terms of the printed word. And um, Reverdy's life was very interesting and when it was interesting, it didn't, to me, write the kind of great poetry he wrote later. Um, in his early life, one of his uh, girlfriends was Coco Chanel, who was also a patron of his. And as I said, he was an intimate of the great modern painters. But in the 1930s, he had a religious, mystical vision which later became profound doubt. But he moved with his wife to the monastery of Solem, where he died, I think, in 1977. But it is the later work which seems to soar into the huge power of his mystical insights. And this is a problem, because the secular age we live in, with its obsession with technology finds the kind of religious passion of mysticism completely and absolutely unbelievably inappropriate to the way people live their lives now. Um, I made some translations of Reverdy, which I included in my collected poems, 
And when I actually translated these poems, I had the text in front of me, but I have yet to find a way of actually resourcing it back because of the lack of um, proper indexing of French poetry in, in, in originally produced poems. But I do think the poems I chose do reflect the best of the kind of passion that Reverdy had. Transparencies of Day The cloud-formed sails, the bird's wings outspread, a passing voice, deserted borders, always watched, the vastness of all creation, the air vibrates with memory, the wing beats ebb, the lonely cries are stacked, the forced march of invaders along our shores. Higher than the tree, further than Christ's fingertips stretched on the cross, dishevelled shadows, and on the open road, daybreak without end. This seems to me, whatever the weaknesses of my translation, which may be more an imitation, but this seems to me the kind of power, the mystical vision, that Reverdy is particularly good at. Um, there is very little, not only in terms of translation, but in terms of critical writing about Reverdy. I think there are only three texts in English, um, one of which is dealing with his early Cubist writing, uh, another of which deals with one of his most sig significant works, Les Ardoises, Les Ardoises du Trois, Roof Slates. But this book on Roof Slates, unfortunately, doesn't translate the quotations. The best overall guide is Jean Schroeder's Pierre Reverdy, which was published by Twain in 1981. And um, Schroeder makes the point that... For Reverdy, the depth of the dream is the richest source of poetic inspiration. And he goes on to quote Reverdy, Le rêve du poète, c'est l'immense fier au maille anombrable qui drague sans espoir les eaux profondes à la recherche d'un problématique tresson, which is translated as the poet's dream is the immense net with numerous meshes which sweeps without hope the deep waters in search for a dubious treasure. As a poet myself, the dream and the muse and the dream of the muse are for me the central vision, the inspiration of how I've always written. And this is simply not the way people write poetry now and it's not the kind of poetry people want to read now, though I find it very difficult to understand the way poetry has moved away from the great forebears of Pound and Eliot. Um, Eliot, as is well known, was deeply impressed by La Fogue, not a French poet I personally find any resonance with, but there was always a sense in poetry of the huge power of French writing. This is Wallace Stevens, although Wallace Stevens again is not poetry that poem that poet that resonates with me. And in John Ashbery, again a poet who I find basically unreadable. But Ashbery did spend ten years living in Paris and learning French. And Ashbery thought he would learn it fluently in six months in fact it took him a decade with daily lessons but it doesn't actually seem to have affected his work not in any way I can ever see um, the there has been a, a, a beautiful beginning of translations done by uh, my friend and mentor the late Martin Bell uh, a collection of Reverdy translations published by Bristol University's White Knights Press, which is extremely difficult to get hold of. And these translations are very interesting in terms that they actually take some prose poems and translate them with some 
poems which are not prose poems, but they are very early works of brevity, which is a problem for me because sadly Martin Bell died the very day a cheque arrived from the Arts Council which had funded many more such translations and there may be others but they have never been unfortunately as yet published. And um, the first one I'll read in English and then perhaps in French it's called Fetish. She's a small doll, a good luck puppet and flutters at my window as the wind wills. The rain has soaked her dress, her face and her hands, which are losing colour. She has even lost one leg, but her ring remains, and with it her power. In winter, she knocks at the glass with her little blue-shod foot, and dances, dances with joy, and with cold to warm her heart, a heart of lucky wood. At night, she raises supplicating arms towards the stars. And this poem is taken from the collection Plupart du Temps, and uh, this is the original French he translated. Fétiche. Petite poupée, marionnette porte bonheur, elle se débat à ma fenêtre, au gré du vent. La pluie a mouillé sa robe, sa figure et ses mains qui déteignent. Elle a même perdu une jambe, mais sa barbe reste et avec elle son pouvoir. L'hiver, elle frappe à la vitre de son petit pied chaussé de bleu et danse, danse de joie, de froid, pour réchauffer son cœur, son cœur de bois porte bonheur. La nuit, elle lève ses bras, suppliant vers les étoiles. You see here in this early work in, in 1915 the beginnings of the mystical vision which inspired Reverdy to write his later poems but sadly the later poems remain entirely untranslated and if you simply glance through my favourite collection which is Man d'Oeuvre which I presume means something like a the main body of work, you can find some incredibly powerful poems. And, but the problem is, they simply haven't been translated into English. And they're not particularly difficult poems in the way Rader's work is. But then again, they're not exactly that straightforward either. But you can find, by just simply flicking through the book, unbelievably powerful poems on subjects like the rainbow. La Conciel, but these are not subjects that English readers seem interested in any more, which is to me very, very sad. And um, no matter how many editions are published in France, until somebody really gets to work to translate them into English, so you can have a bilingual text, then I don't see us getting a long way into this kind of poetry, sadly. It is a poetry which has no equal in English. Uh, I can't think of any mystical poet who wrote in English. Uh, St John of the Cross, I believe, originally wrote in Spanish. And this was many centuries ago. Mysticism is not the flavour of the month. It's not the flavour of the decade. It is most certainly not the flavour of the 21st century.